A new report suggests that OpenAI is actively considering making its own AI chips. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in around five minutes. We start off the day with a juicy new exclusive report from Reuters this morning that OpenAI is considering making its own AI chips in order to deal with what has become a huge bottleneck to the development of artificial intelligence, which is access to advanced chips. So, like I mentioned, this report comes from Reuters. Their sources are people familiar with the company's plans, which tends to mean either in investors or employees or partners. Now, what we know is that OpenAI has not made a decision to do this for sure yet, but that since last year, it has been exploring a number of different ways to deal with chip shortages, up to and including actually making them itself. As a way of conveying how serious this possibility is to them, they've actually gone as far as evaluating a potential acquisition target that would help them with these plans. Now, OpenAI's desire to figure out better access to chips is nothing new. Sam Altman has been quite clear about how big of a problem it has been this year and how much it has changed their plans. It seems like the GPT vision tool that we've recently gotten was actually ready a number of months ago, but was held up by access to these advanced chips. On top of just getting access to these processors, the other problem is how expensive they are. Now, of course, it would be a very serious undertaking for OpenAI to actually go out and try to create custom chips. However, it would also reflect the strategy taken by other tech giants in the AI space, including Google and Amazon. Google has their tensor processing units, and Amazon's chips have actually been in the news recently as they were an integral part of their just announced deal with Anthropic. While Amazon's investment into Anthropic, which is $1.25 billion so far and can go up to $4 billion, took most of the headlines, one of the big parts of the deal seems to be Anthropic's commitment to use Amazon's custom chips in the development of their future models. From the Anthropic announcement, AWS will become Anthropic's primary cloud provider for mission-critical workloads, providing our team with access to leading compute infrastructure in the form of AWS Trainium and Infertia chips, which will be used in addition to existing solutions for model training and deployment. Together, we'll combine our respective expertise to collaborate on the development of future Trainium and Infertia technology. So Anthropic gets access to these new chips, you would think at a discounted cost, and Amazon Amazon gets plugged into one of the competitors in the major foundation model space. Now, of course, NVIDIA continues to dominate the AI chip space, and there's not really a lot of indication that that's changing anytime soon, but it's clear that NVIDIA alone cannot meet the demand, and that the status quo of 2023 is destined to change. Whether OpenAI ultimately decides to get involved remains to be seen, but it certainly shows how significant an issue this is in the broader AI competition. Speaking of big companies in AI, one of the trends that we've been watching recently is the shift to AI hardware. Maybe the most notable announcement on that front are reports that Sam Altman from OpenAI and Johnny Ive, formerly of Apple, have been in discussions to build a new type of AI-centric device and have even talked to Masayoshi Son of SoftBank about a billion dollars in funding for the startup venture. The information called at the beginning of the AI phone wars. Well, if that designation is true, it seems like the existing players are trying to retrofit their current offerings to appear like AI phones, even if that's not exactly what they are. For example, The Verge's reflection on the Google Pixel 8 launch was that it was a, quote, parade of AI. The Verge's John Porter writes, I don't know if you've heard, but Google's latest products are filled with AI. There's Magic Editor, a photo editing tool powered by generative AI. There's Conversation Detection, an audio transparency feature powered by AI. There are improved heart rate algorithms, which, yes, are also powered by AI. Now, Porter ends his review as somewhat skeptical. He talks about the announcement of the Bard update of Google Assistant and the example that I referenced the other day as well of how it could help post a picture of Baxter the dog on the user's social media. Porter writes, As a tech demo for generative AI, it makes sense. AI is increasingly good at recognizing and describing images, and one of generative AI's greatest strengths is writing in a particular style. But ignore the AI part and think about this purely as a smartphone feature, and I think it's utterly baffling. How on earth have we gotten to the point where it makes sense for a smartphone to draft our personal social media posts for us? What's the point? If you're asking a machine to draft an image caption for a photo, then why are you publishing the caption in the first place? What are we doing here? Now, frankly, this is kind of what I said around that launch as well the other day, that I have a lot of skepticism around what are being presented as the ways that people will use these AI-powered personal assistants. Porter's theory is that, quote, in the absence of a killer app for generative AI, Google is throwing features at a wall and seeing what sticks. It feels like the search giant has a hammer labeled generative AI, and its search for nails is taking the company to weird places. I have two qualms with that analysis. The first is that I'm not sure that it's the right characterization to say that generative AI has no killer app. ChatGPT 
is already creating fundamental changes in people's workflows across different professions, across education. It is very hard not to describe that as a killer app based on any definition of a killer app I've ever seen. What's more, I think that image generation in the form of things like Midjourney has been fundamentally transformational as well. Every part of the way that I create this podcast is now in some ways touched and shaped by AI. And I think that just because we all know about Midjourney and ChatGPT already doesn't mean that they're not killer apps. But the second point of disagreement with Porter's analysis is the idea that throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks is a bad thing. I actually tweeted about this in a separate context the other day. I said, point, every startup in the world is just slapping AI on things. Counterpoint, no way to figure out what stuff AI actually changes without trying it. I think the evidence of services like ChatGPT and Midjourney are intriguing enough that it's only reasonable for startups and big tech companies to be experimenting with AI in just about every context they can imagine. I think it would be a mistake to assume that it's actually going to work and be sticky. I've shared at numerous points what I think isn't or is likely to work. I have a hard time imagining that Meta's characters are going to work, but hey, it might not be for me. But I don't think they shouldn't try. I think the whole point of new products and new features and entrepreneurship is to try new stuff. So I say bring on all the silly AI features. We'll figure out soon enough which ones are actually valuable or not. And I'm almost sure that we won't have been as able to predict what works and what doesn't as we might think we are sitting from where we are today. Moving on and speaking of mid-journey, according to the information Andreessen Horowitz has recently discussed a big investment, a nine-figure investment into mid-journey rival Ideogram. Now, Ideogram announced the fundraising round only a couple of months ago, but apparently they've been back at the VC table and are talking about raising between 75 and $100 million. Now, obviously, the image generation space is an extremely crowded field. Indeed, in many ways, the competition that people are really looking at in that space is mid-journey versus the new ChatGPT integrated Dolly 3. But Ideogram's desire to raise money is a reflection of how much compute costs and how expensive it is to compete in these core AI spaces. Now, as of yet, it doesn't appear that a deal has been done, so we will keep an eye out from here. Wrapping up today with a look at how CEOs are thinking about generative AI, major professional services firm KPMG has just released the results of a new survey of U.S. company CEOs. The results when it came to artificial intelligence were quite, quite clear. 72% of U.S. CEOs say that generative AI is a, quote, top investment priority. And interestingly, it seems like people are taking a medium to long-term view of how it's going to benefit their companies. Only 23% of those surveyed CEOs say that they expect a return in one to three years, with 62% saying they expect a return in three to five years. Now, as an interesting sub-story, some have speculated that the rise of AI could push workers back to the office. In other words, workers might feel more like they have to prove what they are doing, given how much of their jobs might be able to be automated. And these CEOs seem to be very down with that idea. Last year, only 34% of the CEOs surveyed said that they envisioned their staff working permanently at the office within three years, and this year that's all the way back up to 62%. Last year, 20% said that they envisioned their teams as fully remote, and that's all the way down to 4%. Anyways, it's very clear how powerful and important a trend generative AI is, and so of course, we will keep covering it for you every day here at the AI Breakdown. Up next, the main AI Breakdown. 